<laughs> hey, welcome everyone to Kiss Meets the Podcast 4K, the second coming. I am one of your hosts, Eli Clawson. And I have been trying to figure out whether or not I want to start a new band called Decapitated Squirrel Orgy. <laughs> Sounds I like a plan to me. Just can't decide. I think we can use that uh, brand new sexy intro as a song, though. I mean... Yes, yes. Tell us how you guys like that. Um, by the way, yours truly's. We uh, wrote and recorded that. So, yeah. <laughs> Bronco. <laughs> is that the Barry Pe- uh, Dr. Pepper? It is, yeah. How is that? It is not bad. I have not seen or had it yet. Yes, we're not sponsored, by the way. Yes. <laughs> nope, we're not sponsored by Pepsi products whatsoever. Not at all. Not at all. No, it's not <sighs> Right off the bat. <laughs> All right. So, uh, geez, um, we're back. Finally, uh, getting this episode out of the way. Um, if anybody played along and listened to this week's album, we are sorry. Uh, <laughs> do thank you for torturing yourself, yeah. just like we did, to listen to the thing. I just did it before the show and. God, I want that time back. <laughs> All I could think is, why are these songs so long? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, on that note, this week's album features Mr. Vinny Vincent. Um, the album is Instant Replay by Dan Hartman. Um, come to find out, this album also features... G.E. Smith on guitar, who people may know from the Saturday Night Live band uh, from back in the day. Um, pretty good guitar player in his own right. I think he kind of handled most of the, uh, the lead stuff on here from what I could tell, though, listening to it. Um, however, if Vinny played ta- saxophone on this record, I have a lot of good things to say about it. <laughs> right. Other than that, I couldn't hear a lick of anything Vinny did. Nope. <laughs> Whatever could be not a thing so th- this of course is nothing what you know <laughs> don't go in this you know thinking it's going to be invasion stuff or kiss soundings this is pure 100 percent disco like yeah. total total disco um hey i like some disco don't get me wrong good stuff's good stuff and to be honest uh at least one song on here kind of caught my ear a little bit, but for the most part, it was just kind of like, Oh my God, these songs are long. Just, you know, your basic, you know, studio 54 type stuff you would hear in the club back in the seventies. I would imagine, you know, while you're snorting white powder in the corner, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, yeah. So, I mean, it kind of is what it is. So we have quite a few comments to catch up on. Um, Last time I looked, I recall there was some pretty, uh, there's some doozies in there. So looking forward to getting into these. Yeah. I had, I had to watch a little bit of the first episode again because I, I had forgotten how many uh, comments we had read already. And, and the answer <laughs> was basically none. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, just about any comment we have here is, is uh, new. Uh, so we got first uh, back on our episode number one, uh, the Chelsea album. We got from Robbie Stars here, rolling along in long over. <laughs> so it is Wicked Lester. One, I give it a four. I'd give it a two, but the vocalist sounds like Dana Carvey, which gives me a good laugh uh, every tune. Uh, I thought the last song on the album would have been Chopping Broccoli. One word for this album, crap. <laughs> She's chopping broccoli. She's chopping broccoli. She's chopping broccoli. I hadn't heard that until I read that comment, but yeah, no, totally. Uh, Oh, uh, speaking of SNL, back when it was good. Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, Jay Rucker on here says, My dad didn't get into rock until 1975 when he bought Dress to Kill and Aerosmith Get Your Wings. Boy, that's a that's a heck of a way to start right there. Indeed. Yeah. 
Uh, Jay also gave us his uh, picks for the Wicked Lester album, which we did give uh, get put in there. He says that he gives it a solid five. I thought I would hate this, but it's really not that bad. We definitely agree there, Jay. His top three was When the Bell Rings, We Want to Shout It Out Loud, and Love Her All I Can, where he notes whoever the lead guitarist is rules on this song. That's for sure. Absolutely. Who would that have been? Uh, would, it, would it have been Cornell? No. Uh, no, because they had already taken him out. Lee something? Oh, uh, Lee. Um, uh, it's on the tip of my tongue. Yeah. Same. Uh, oh, well. Yeah, anyway, yeah. He we rules. Have, yes, exactly. Yeah, definitely agreed there. Uh, right in Adams Town here, this is in reference to Chelsea again, says, The album is not bad, but not hard rock enough for me. Call it a day and Silver Lining are okay. Nice that you go on with the podcast. A lot of good stuff to go. Like Mr. McFarland, I think Cat Number 1 is a good album. Can't wait for Wendy O. Williams, Keel, Second Sighting, Live to Win, or Spaceman. The Kiss concert in Vienna was fantastic. The comedy part before they played Black Diamond was funny. Good German by Gene, My Highlights, Crazy Crazy Nights, Heaven's on Fire, Say Yeah, Lick It Up, and I Love It Loud, and the people in Europe like the new roses. Happy. Nice. Yeah, I, I noticed they uh, started playing Crazy Crazy Nights again, so I'm yeah. hoping they uh, keep that going when they come back over here for the next leg. Yes, that would be neat. I saw them do that on the uh, Sonic Boom Tour, too, and it wasn't bad for it being a fairly old song by that point, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, we've got Brock McDowell on here. I do believe he is uh, suggesting some names here. So he says, like after a basketball game, Goon Lopeside. Uh, call this set <laughs> garbage baskets. <laughs> uh, as for Peter's playing on Chelsea, uh, five years from now, we find out it was actually Phil Collins and Anton Fig in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Remember, it's just humor. Yes, no, that would be hilarious. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jay Rucker also suggested we should call it Extra Killers or More Killers, or how about Second Coming? There you go, and that's the one we chose. Yeah. Uh, also, we've got Lee uh, Gerstman, I think. Again, as usual, apologies on the pronunciation of the names. I'm terrible with that. He suggests for a name, how about Extra Smooches? <laughs> there you go. That's what we should have called it for this episode. Just this one, yeah. 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 Uh, let's see. So jumping ahead to the Wicked Lester episode. Um, let's see if we can get through here. Yep. Okay, so we got a couple of comments from Robbie Stars here. He says, you guys should review the Kiss My Ass album, and it is coming. It is. It is on the list. Uh, he also says, Keep Me Waiting could have been a cool Kiss tune. This is actually a fun album to listen to. Some cool stuff going on and a few good laughs here and there. I love I Want to Shout It Out Loud and Keep Me Waiting. I'll give this album a 6.5. And yes, I actually like this more than the Peter Chris 78 solo album. Right on, man. Same, same, same. Yep. And yeah, kind of touching again on that first uh, earlier comment. Yes, there are some real doozies coming up that we cannot wait for, but unfortunately, as the nature of the show goes, sometimes we got to throw in some duds at, at the same time. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, speaking of duds, uh, our next comment from Jay is a his list on instant replay, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which we can get put in there. Uh, he says, "I give instant replay a seven. I really enjoyed it. This album really reminds okay. me of Michael Jackson off the wall, which came out the year after. The only thing I didn't like was that every song was so long." Yes, yes. <laughs> so his list, uh, his top three here was "Countdown." This is it. Love is a natural and instant replay. Uh, he also says we should do a box set episode after every week as a bonus episode. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. I mean, I think those are still like album length, uh, which would yeah, that's a lot of that's a lot of listening. We can't listen to that much music. <laughs> much. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's definitely you know way out of the list as far as going chronological but i i do get the idea of just kind of throwing in one of the discs in between each, you know each episode or sprinkling them in here and there 
uh, a comment here from Chuck McFarland. He says, I think Kiss Alive is a perfect 10. I can't see Wicked Lester being any higher than a 5. That's, uh, I see the logic. Yeah, see fair enough. Fair yeah. enough. It went in comparison to Kiss albums. Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. All right. But hey, you look at it in the long run, we wouldn't have had Kiss Alive if it wasn't for the Wicked Lester stuff. So, yeah. you know, got to grow. Yes. And then uh, two comments from William Curry here. He says, question, why doesn't Gene and Paul put out Wicked Lester? Anyone, please. I, I concur 110 million percent. Yes. Um, matter of fact, I was watching the guys over on Kiss My Collectibles, and they got to talking about the Wicked Lester stuff, and you know Jason especially. He's, I know he f basically feels the same way we do. Um, my God, we could... You know, have a whole show discussing that thing and <laughs> why it hasn't happened yet. But right. we we wholeheartedly agree. So hopefully it will happen at some point. Fingers crossed. Yes, definitely. Uh, William also says. Also, do you know any? Uh, does anyone know what might be happening for the fiftieth anniversary? Kind of hoping something big will be coming. Thoughts? I would love to see something to mark 50 years um unfortunately it probably won't involve any sort of live performance i'm sure if you know if they're really sticking true to this thing and you know we're i mean we're still talking what five another five years from now till that happens basically well maybe four depends on how they if they count 73 or 74 is the the proper year but right. i don't know i I'm not sure if maybe they would try to pull off just a one-off show to celebrate the 50 years or maybe a, a special release. Like maybe then we'll finally get the next comprehensive DVD or some sort of, you know, something big to represent 50. I mean, they, they kind of went a little big with the 40, but 50 is definitely the much bigger anniversary. So who knows, man? Um, I guess we'll all be sitting here waiting and seeing what happens in the next four or five years. And uh, hopefully we'll be here to talk about it when it happens. So. Right. Absolutely. All right. So that is it for comments. Are you ready to get into some album info? Yes. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, first off. <laughs> this album sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I bought this just for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, did, I totally didn't. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, geez. So, I don't know about you, but uh, the big question on my mind is, who is Dan Hartman? <laughs> right. Or apparently, who was Dan Hartman? Yes, indeed. Uh, so, I can tell you a little bit about that. An interesting thing, though, is... Apparently, when he uh, struck out on his own to start recording and releasing music under the name Dan Hartman, uh, he was also worried that 100 million other people would be wondering who is Dan Hartman, and that's <laughs> actually the name of his first album. <laughs> oh, jeez. So, wait a minute. Did, did he come from a band or something? Is that... Yes, indeed. He did. So, uh, this is interesting because I felt kind of stupid because I listened to this album thinking that his voice sounded a little bit familiar, but then I was like, yeah, I mean, it's, there's nothing super, you know, unique about it or anything, but having read his Wikipedia page, we will all recognize his songwriting and voice from. Nope. That's Dan Hartman. Wow. I love that song. Yep, yep. He wrote and sung. Uh, he was the lead vocalist in the Edgar Winter group for a little while. Wow, no kidding. Indeed. And, uh, yeah, that's that's his song right there. And uh, to answer your earlier question, that is Edgar Winter playing saxophone on this album. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. No wonder, man. No wonder that stood out. Indeed. So weird, weird connection there. And then, of course, we've got the G.E. Smith connection, which I, I believe he was also connected to Edgar Winter for a little bit. Uh, man. Turns out this is kind of an all-star album of sorts in a way. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, yeah, he did a lot of different stuff. He released a lot of albums. Instant Replay is the third of which, uh, unfortunately, he did end up dying from an AIDS-related brain tumor in 1994. Mm. 
hell of a way to go. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like, like I said, Instant Replay is his third full-length album. Uh, the first one, like I said, was called Who Is Dan Hartman? <laughs> which is <laughs> uh, This album was released in 1978, uh, and it was actually produced by Dan. He just did it himself. This was recorded at the Schoolhouse in Westport, Connecticut, and also the Hit Factory in New York City. Uh, trying to look at some other stuff here. There isn't a whole lot of, excuse me, information on this album. Uh, this was mixed by Tom Moulton, which uh, he also did a bunch of stuff. Uh, he is actually the originator of the breakdown section. The, uh, he came up with the, uh, that idea for a song. The breakdown is this guy's idea. Uh, wow. He also is a famous remixer from the 70s. He invented the idea of remixing songs to have disco beats. Uh, he also invented the 12-inch single vinyl format. <laughs> Jeez, I've got a nice collection of those, so thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, as far as personnel on this album, of course, we've got Dan Hartman, who did lead and backing vocals, rhythm and bass guitars, keyboards. Uh, he played all the instruments on Chocolate Box and all the instruments except the saxophone and congos on the song Instant Replay. So there wasn't left, wasn't a whole lot left <laughs> for everyone else. Wow. We've also got Blanche Napoleon, who did backing vocals, Vinnie Vincent, who did rhythm and acoustic guitars, tambourine and backing vocals, and picturing Vinnie Vincent recording tambourine is not a pretty sight. Uh, <laughs> With that dirt stash he had at the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. got uh, G.E. Smith on rhythm and lead guitars. Edgar Winter uh, played saxophone on instant replay and also countdown This Is It. Hilly mm -hmm. Michaels played drums and percussion. Larry Washington did the congas on Instant Replay, and we've got the Soul Soul Orchestra, uh, who oh. just did orchestra throughout the album. Uh, I feel like Hilly Michaels was someone, too. Let me look at that real quick. Soul Soul Orchestra was a pretty good band from the kind of disco slash funk era. Um, I've, I think I've got a couple records of theirs, and they had some good stuff. Nice. But yeah, it really is an all-star album. Apparently, uh, Hilly Michaels was first in a band called Joy, which featured a young Michael Bolton, which is interesting because we're going to be doing some Michael Bolton albums. Uh, the, band, the band was called Joy? Joy, yes. That wouldn't be the same Joy that had the hit um, Apollo... No, never mind. The song was called Joy. Never mind. Uh, yeah, I was gonna Invalid. <laughs> doesn't seem to be a YouTube page for that band, so I don't know if they really any did, did anything. It uh, says he was most famous for playing drums in the band Sparks. Oh, yeah. That's a uh, pretty big band, especially at, for the Canadians. Gotcha. Uh, they seem to be more popular up there. Yes, this uh, is interesting. He did end up releasing a couple of solo albums later on. Uh, I'd be, I'm would be i curious to see if they're still kind of disco-y. Uh, I don't know if you looked, uh, if you bothered yourself watching the Instant Replay music video, but he's a pretty goofy dude while he's playing. <laughs> I, I don't I didn't watch the whole thing, but I did I did watch a decent amount of it and as much as I could take, I guess. <laughs> Pretty much. So See, I mean, being that this album itself is, you know, a little wacky and out of the usual, hey, it's fun to sit here and learn these kind of th little tidbits about it and you know, who played on what. It's it's really you know, it's it's shocking. Yeah. And speaking of the whole S N L references that keep coming up, I'm sure it would say, but He's he's not in any relation to Phil Hartman, is he? I don't think so. Okay. Just kind of wondered, especially with G.E. Smith being involved. It's like, go figure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we do also have uh, Steve and Rochelle McGowan's picks, uh, both for Wicked Lester and for uh, Instant Replay here, which we've got put in there. Um, Steve's got a little... He's got a couple of things here. So uh, regarding Wicked Lester... Steve says, I remember the first time I heard this, it instantly made me think of the music you would hear in the ghost chase scenes in Scooby-Doo cartoons in the 70s. Actually, it still makes me think of that. <laughs> yeah, right. It reminds him of going to those clubs in the 70s. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right after he got out of college. Yes. <laughs> he says, I truly love the album, though. It's an album I don't get tired of listening to. Really cool to hear what the three Kiss songs sounded like during this era. I still need to add this to my collection before I turn to dust. Don't even say it, Eli. <laughs> uh, well, at least you have the vacuum there. So <laughs> yeah, so we can sweep Steve up. Okay. <laughs> so Steve 
Steve did give Wicked Lester a 7 out of 10. His top three were Keep Me Waiting, Sweet Ophelia, and Love Her All I Can. Uh, Rochelle didn't have any notes on this one, but she did rank it an 8 out of 10. Her top three were When the Bell Rings, Simple Type, and What Happens in the Darkness. Uh, also, we've got their picks for Instant Replay. Rochelle's top three was Double O Love, Instant Replay, and Time and Space. She ranked this album 3 out of 10. Steve gave this album a 1 out of 10. Uh, his top three were Double O Love, Instant Replay, and Time and Space. And uh, also he notes, um, I got nothing. Can we just move on to the Wendy O. Williams album? <laughs> Patience, my friend. Yeah, a little bit. We will get to it before you turn to dust, I promise. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so we better hurry. <laughs> uh, so by the way, there is only six tracks on this album to begin with, so... We're, our top three is half the album. <laughs> yeah. uh, but again, long tracks. I mean, the second track is like 14 minutes long. You got like a six minute plus. I think the shortest track on here is like two and a half minutes. You know, your standard. Right. Everything else is right up around four, four and up. <laughs> yeah, they kind of pulled a biogenesis here and did a six song album that still clocked in <laughs> 40 minutes. <laughs> Now you know our inspiration was Dan Hartman. That's why we write the long songs, and you know, we have, we have that disco uh, sound to our music, and uh, yeah. as you can also hear in the intro music to this show. Okay. <laughs> oh Lord, are we ready to get into it? I think so. Should I get my vacuum? Yes. <laughs> it's a disaster it's a disaster nothing but high high quality production here folks yes, yes. I'm just going to start digitally distorting my face one of these times. Yep, you better. Oh, how about that, Mr. Dan Harkin? There you go. Oh, that is such a creepy album cover. Not to mention Ronnie Montrose plays on this album, too. The Edgar Winter album. Yep, and it would eventually be replaced by Derringer, if I'm recalling correctly. Yes. Absolutely. All right, so getting into this album, uh, track number one, of course, is the title track, Instant Replay, which also, uh, as Luke mentioned earlier, is the only video that they, well, it was basically from some television show, I guess, is the only proper video that's on YouTube uh, to see what the band looked like in person. And um, so this is that track, Instant Replay. Um, I ranked it at my number three, and again, it's it's just your basic straight up disco, you know, high high tempo um, dance track. You know, nothing nothing super special about it. So, number three. Uh, clearly, right from the start, I mean, you can tell you're in for an interesting ride. This song definitely is well indicative of what the rest of the album is you know uh i will give it this though this was definitely a good song choice to start the album you know it's upbeat and it's exciting uh which is nice the middle vocalization is weird uh but having said that i like uh dan hartman's voice you know he's got good range he's got really good control over which notes he hits and when uh which is especially impressive to me knowing this came from an era far before autotune could have fixed anything like that you know? absolutely man and you know throughout the album it's like his voice kept reminding me of something and maybe that's why now that i know that he was the singer in Edgar winter maybe that's what i was picturing i'm like man it sounds familiar to something you know and yeah. no wonder and you know i, I love the Edgar winter stuff you know it's such a great album and uh you know tons of classic stuff on there there he is on the back too yeah. I did end up number two. Number T. 
All right. Uh, track two. This is the epic 14 minute plus track. This is uh, Countdown hyphen. This is it. Um, this is my number two. Number two. Um, all I could think of every time I kept hearing the this is it phrase was the Michael Jackson song, This Is It. Yep. Like, that's all it reminded me of. Um, nothing, again, nothing to add. It's still pretty straightforward. You know, it's, it's just one of them perfect, you know, for the time, again, playing them in the dance clubs. You know, it's that perfect length of song to just people get out on that floor and dance dance the night away as they say um you know for 15 minutes plus for one song that's you know you had to be pretty tired after that <laughs> yeah yeah uh as this one started i was really curious what could possibly fill up 14 minutes in this song <laughs> right I was, I was really interested to see what you know when you think of disco music, you you basically think of instant replay. How many different places can you go with something like that? Right. Uh, by the time we I reached the second chorus, still not sure I heard any verse. Quickly, <laughs> 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 uh, I noticed around the five minute mark. I'm enjoying the song, but I'm I'm tuning out. You know what I mean? Just subconsciously finding that I'm not really paying attention. Uh, it's just nothing specifically interesting enough to really hold me there. Um, Coming into what I assume is the this is it part of the song, I like the melody that comes in, and uh, I assume the big, like, effecty thing between the songs was supposed to be a rocket taking off after the countdown, which mm. was an interesting touch. Although, what I'm, I'm curious what made them merge these two. What does this is it have to do with countdown? Um, but just as I was beginning to let my mind wander uh, into that, a sax solo came in, and I was... I was all back. I was 100% back in now. Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was listening to that sax. Um, and then a little while later I noted, okay, I see. So they go back into the countdown part of the song later, which makes a little bit more sense. This isn't just two different songs that they smashed together, but I still, by the end, I still didn't end up seeing any connection in the lyrics that makes sense out of why they thought to combine these two otherwise completely different songs. So uh, still not a hundred percent sure on that. But uh, ended up putting that one on number five for me just because, you know, like I said, it didn't really hold me very well. Yeah, I found myself doing the same thing. I was um, I was sitting here doing stuff on the computer as I was listening to it. Now I wasn't looking at porn. Um, <laughs> not yet. And I, I kind of did the same thing. Like I found myself like, OK, I pulled, you know, pulled up the player to see where it was at. And it was like right in that five, you know, six minute part. And I'm like. Oh my God! There's still like you know a no whole nother song to go basically, and uh, but yeah, I was right there with you because I was saying uh, you know <laughs> I I know Vinny didn't play saxophone on the album, but I was just kind of joking to myself that had he did play saxophone on this album, this would have been a standout performance by Vinny because yeah. it was good stuff. Come to find out again, Edgar Winter, who again great artist. You know, love a lot of stuff he did. So, I mean, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, moving into track three, Double O Love. And this is my number one. Oh, yeah. Same Yes. This one, um, this one caught me, man. It was, it was more, I don't know. It, it It's kind of weird to say aggressive when it's disco, but it kind of had that more, you know, the vocals were a little bit more kind of in your face and just that more kind of harder dancing type beat to it and um i can't really think of another song to compare to that's kind of similar in that sound as far as like the disco but i, I one's not coming to my mind right away but there's a bunch out there that are like that but um yeah this one definitely caught me and um it, it felt the most different to me out of all the tracks um and that's why it's my number one yeah absolutely I really like the guitar riff that starts that one. That was that was one of my favorite parts. The whole feel of it was just neat. Uh, the verse came in, and I was like, man, I, I really like this too. Just uh, immediately, not even a minute into the song, I was like, this is probably my number one. <laughs> this is yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, neat guitar solo in the middle. Uh, and yeah, kind of like you were saying, I felt like that one more than the others had just a bit more of a 70s rock feel 
and but it did retain the disco elements that kept it nicely tied to the rest of the album. So it didn't feel out of place, just more in the vein of regular old seventies rock. Right. And you know, to be honest, that's a song that you know, I may revisit it and listen to it on occasion. You know, not not like it's gonna be on constant rotation, but it's something I'll probably I'll probably keep on the computer in the collection and you know, every now and then maybe throw it on. But you get in those moods for different things. What's that? You're not gonna do an instant replay of this one? I might. <laughs> you know, sometimes you gotta get all oiled up and you want something to dance to and <laughs> this this would be the right stuff. <laughs> that needs to be like a little post credits podcast thing is just you <laughs> in that room dancing around for <laughs> And that perfectly leads us into the next title, Chocolate Box. <laughs> no and no double entendres there, I'm sure. No. Uh, so this one ended up being my number five next to last. Um, again, it just kind of kind of went back to losing losing interest, and uh, you know, it was this kind of back to the straightforward stuff, nothing super special, and. That's about it. Chocolate box. Yeah. Yeah, this one, my number four. Uh, I, I know this one also seemed to have a little bit of a different feel than the other songs. Interesting, but not catch me like Double O Love did. Uh, I'll admit, though, it's hard not to like groove to that kind of funk. You know what I mean? Uh, and then, of course, also I had to note, what are the lyrics about? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Chocolate that's in a box. Yeah, clearly that's what it was. <laughs> I also listened to this before I read the Wikipedia page, so so I was spared the horror of knowing that Dan Hartman was gay while listening yeah. to this. So <laughs> Right, right. Not nothing wrong with that, by the way, people, because you know, Steve's a co- Steve's a constant guest and you know, <laughs> we we definitely embody that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> no, just makes those lyrics take on a uh, potentially very different <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, we know where Forrest Gump got inspired for the box of chocolates line. Yes. So he must have had this album at some point, and he loved this song, so he just, you know, his mama came up with that saying. Yep. And that was my stupid dad joke of the week. Thank you. I'll be here all day. I got one thing to say about that joke. Oh. <laughs> so bristly i know you know ironically i got that to clean my car out and it sucks at sucking (laughs) it's terrible (laughs) or is your car just that dirty i mean that's a possibility (laughs) that it refuses to get clean no i won't do it you can't make me the trash makes me run it's part of me It's like the um, the DeLorean. You got to stuff a bunch of junk into it to make it run. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, love it's a natural thing. So yeah. that leads us to to track number five. Love is a natural. Love right. is a natural. What a thing. What is it? That's that's my note on this too. In all caps, uh, natural is an adjective, not a noun. Love is a natural. What? <laughs> It's like the OCD in me that I didn't even realize I had was coming out. Like, where's this last word? Complete the sentence. What is it? <laughs> and they don't even say it in a song. Yeah. So, hence, this is my number four. Um, but, yeah, it's like complete the sentence. Where, what, what's going on here? What, what Love is a natural what? Yeah. I mean, at least Peter said, you know, love is an a, is a easy thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, number four for me. Uh, yeah, uh, dead last for me. I gotta say, uh, mm-hmm. the orchestra in the beginning almost brings to mind like a like a classic '60s spy movie, which I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, total change up for the verse, which was cool. However, personally, not big fan of the fast paced drum beat when all the other instruments seem like they're kind of laid back, chilled out. Uh, I feel like that was a disco thing, and it just it didn't didn't work. Uh, and then, yeah, as petty as it is, I'll, I'll admit that it bothered me more than a little that the title is grammatically incorrect. <laughs> so yeah, dead last. yeah, that that's what our lives have become. People, we're sitting here 
ranking these kind of albums and complaining about the titles. <laughs> Grammatical errors, my God. Yeah, the drummer uh, had too much coke that day when he went to record, so everything's up tempo. Yes. <laughs> slow down, man. This is a love song. I am slow down. What are you talking about? Yes. <laughs> my name's Hilly. What do you want? Hilly. So coming into the last song, Time and Space, which is my last song, uh, number six. Now, this was the only song to me that really had a standout uh, guitar solo. And again, I'm thinking, oh, there's, there's Vinny. There we go. We finally hear something that's Vinny. Well, then I'm thinking, you know what? I guarantee that's G.E. Smith playing that part because it, it sounds more like his style. Um, so I'm thinking, well, I guess Vinny really didn't get, get any time to shine. He mostly just probably did background vocals, rhythm guitar type stuff on here. So, um, again, I could be wrong, but just to my ear, it sounded closer to GE Smith style of playing. And, uh, so that was really the only thing that caught me with that song. And, uh, and that was it. I also... Uh, noted this particular guitar solo. That's interesting. Um, just right right away, the beginning of this one, it brought like 80s ballads to mind, which I thought was a bit kind of ahead of its time, I guess, you know? Uh, you could hear that they're transitioning into that era. Uh, I mean, I really enjoyed the way the chorus mixed the like big 80s style huge harmonies with the 70s era drum sound and instrumentation. That was... Uh, for me, it really seemed like a cross, a crossover of the two eras. Uh, I did note here that I thought the solo might have been Vinny, but only because the like whammy style vibrato, which is definitely part of Vinny's thing. But that's honestly that's the only thing that reminded me of that. You know, Vinny has that sort of proclivity towards weird notes and weird scales, and and uh, picking high notes with his middle or ring finger when while he's playing low notes, which none of that was in there. So, yeah. yeah. Probably G.E. Smith there. Uh, the chord choices in this song were cool, too, I thought. And I found that this one was keeping my attention better than some of the others have. Uh, and also, the piano note at the end of the song was kind of a nice touch as far as album endings go. You know, if you're not going to end huge, it did kind of have that bit of finality there, which was nice. So uh, I ended up putting that one as uh, number three. Okay. And... So then, so this being his first album, it, it, it almost makes me want to hear the follow-up album just to hear what came next. <laughs> um, how many, I believe he had, what, three, maybe, something like that? Uh, you're talking about Dan Hartman? Yeah, or was this it? This, or no? This actually is his third album here. Um, oh, well, geez. <laughs> yeah, let, me, let me go back and find the discography again. Yeah, so he had Who Is Dan Hartman was first, and then an album called Images later that same year, and then uh, Instant Replay came a couple of years later. Uh, the next year he had Relight My Fire, which the title track was apparently a big hit for him. Uh, 1981 he put out an album, uh, actually two it looks like, and then he put out an album in 84 and 89. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well. Well, maybe not. Then I was thinking, well, you know, something to come, something that would follow this. Maybe it would make sense, but I don't know. Right. Oh, and, wow. What? I also just noticed he was born on December 8th, which seems to be kind of like a central date for all of music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there are a ton of musicians who have either been born on or died on December 8th. That's really weird. Yeah, true. And not to mention, he, you know, he said he died in, what, 94? Four. So only just, you know, a couple of years after Freddie Mercury and Eric Carr. And, but, you know, mainly Freddie Mercury with the whole AIDS-related thing. I mean, wow. Yeah. But I got to say, I was kind of, I kind of shocked myself here because I truly sat here thinking I'm going to not have a thing to say about any song. I'm just going to basically have to say the numbers. <laughs> that's pretty much it, but surprisingly, things kind of ended up coming out, and uh, <laughs> I guess it kind of helped learning the extra things behind the album and who's on it and things like that. It kind of 
it kind of actually piqued my interest more as we did the show than when I was listening to the actual <laughs> album earlier. So right. there, there you go. The, the, the point of this show, I guess. <laughs> it is, yeah. I just, I also just read, this is kind of interesting too, because it seems unlikely. Uh, apparently the creators of grand theft auto were also big Dan Hartman fans. Uh, as I can dream about you, which was one of his songs was, uh, featured in the game Grand Theft Auto Vice City Stories, and then that title track, Relight My Fire, was uh, featured in Grand Theft Auto The Ballad of Gay Tony. Wow. Yeah, and also I think Free Ride. Free Ride was on one of those radio stations uh, on a couple of the games. Oh, yeah, it had to be. That's like one of those perfect road songs. <laughs> yeah, that, that is crazy. So, uh, getting an overall ranking, um, I... I I was going to give this a one also, but then when I think about it and, you know, totally trying to rank it as what it is, a disco album and thinking of other disco that was at around at the time or that I like or listen to and not trying to think of it as all oh, this is an album Vinnie Vincent's on. So I have to compare it to what he did in Kiss or Invasion and stuff like that. It's like, no, because it's a whole different. You, you know you really can't right so i'm gonna i'm gonna have to at least give it a uh it's not much better but a two um you know i, I was thinking one but i gotta at least go a two and uh you know because double double love definitely made it made it up for me and uh you know the the talent that's on this record i mean yes it's a disco album had had this have been something more along the lines of Edgar Winter Group, it may have been an even better album, you know, who knows. But for what it is and the talent that's all, all over this album, I mean, it's, you know, it's good stuff. It's a good representation of that time frame and what what was out at the time, what the thing was. Yes, people hated it. Some people still hate disco. Um, you know, people compared it to... You know, today we have a lot of that, you know, pop and boy band and, you know, that a lot of that rap and stuff. That's kind of what we compare or hate today that is how people felt about disco back then. But um, I think it really does stand up for its time and uh, it goes right along with, you know, you can put it on with all that stuff that was big in disco, you know, Bee Gees, Village People, whatever, whatever the case, you know, Saturday Night Fever. <laughs> So yeah, solid two. Uh, yeah, well, uh, well, I can't say that I'll probably ever find a reason to listen to this album again. Uh, I have to say I did enjoy it for what it was, you know, uh, a lot more than I expected to. That's for sure. Uh, the songs were generally catchy, some more than others, of course. Uh, it did stay faithful to the disco era roots while also kind of dipping into other genres to keep it from all sounding the same, which was nice. Uh, not being a regular listener of disco myself, I was curious, like I mentioned earlier, prior to listening to this, how they would manage not to just have the dance, drums, and bass in every song. Uh, I really had no idea what to expect, and I, you know, I wasn't disappointed. I was a bit impressed how they were able to, like I said, differentiate without really losing that disco feel. Um, one big complaint I have, though, at least from a Kiss point of view, is that like we were talking about, it's really hard to find any Vinny influence in any of the songs at all. You know, being that G.E. Smith also played guitar on the album, it mentioned both rhythm and lead. So it's hard to even tell when or if we're hearing Vinny at all. You know, uh, I was really right. hoping for at least one just freaking burning, obviously, Vinny guitar solo. Just, just one, I was hoping. So not having that, it did make me wonder... You know, did he take a backseat on purpose uh, or did he not yet have those chops we'd see him use in Kiss just a couple of years later? Kind of a curious question, you know? Absolutely. And and see, I may be wrong, but it seems like that stuff that he played on and uh, I believe it's called Treasure. Uh, I think it is. And I want to say it's an album that we're going to be covering. Um, but I want to say... By the time he did that album, which I'm pretty sure came after this, that he did have a little bit of those chops, and that's what kind of started making him known a little more in the music business. 
uh, people started noticing this guy like man he's you know pretty good guitar player and, and again for the style of music it was um, but it seems like I've heard a lot about that and it's sort of uh, I don't know it, it, it kind of comes off as like a bit of a cult favorite nowadays especially like for the Vinny fans and things like that right. um, so I don't know but I'm it's, I'm sure that's on our list. It, it would almost have to be, I guess, unless he didn't play on the whole thing. That may be the, the issue. Because I don't recall anything called Treasure. Now, having said that, though, we do have his box set thing, which surely some of that is on. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be. So eventually we'll probably be talking about that one way or another. Uh, so that that's probably the issue because, again, we're you know trying to stick with things where the the member played on the whole entire album, not just a song or two. And so that may have been the issue with that. I'd have to look into it again. But anyway, uh, that seems to be the, 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 uh, understanding I get about that album and his playing on that. So, and what was your ranking again? Uh, four, four. That's right. I don't think I, I'm not sure if I said it or not. Yeah. Just essentially just because I enjoy it ended up enjoying it more than I thought I would, I think, is why that ended up a bit high. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think I got it all figured up if you're ready for all that. All right. Thank God no ties. <laughs> no ties. Yeah, not a one. Although Steve and Rochelle ruined it. <laughs> you ruined it. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, these were the majority of my notes to <laughs> summarize the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. There were a lot of caps on my notes, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it even got to the point at the very end where I just, like, gave up on writing in general. Like, oh, I just I just lost all hope. Nah, <laughs> it, it wasn't as bad as we make it sound. But maybe it was. I don't know. Next week's a doozy, too. Wait till you hear this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. All right, so... Coming in last place for this album, not any big surprise here. We got Chocolate Box. <laughs> because really, what was he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what's going on here? Anyway, uh, in the number five spot, almost high, very close right here. Uh, Love is a natural. What? Love is a natural last place. <laughs> uh, Coming in fourth place, Countdown, This Is It. Four for 14 minutes. <laughs> Four for how many teens of minutes were in the song? Well, thank God that didn't make the top three, because if, <laughs> if I ever decide down the road to go and listen to the top threes like I did with the Kiss stuff, my God. <laughs> yeah, it'd be, some, it'd, it'd be difficult. Uh, our top three for this coming in third place, thanks to Steve and Rochelle, Time and Space. <laughs> I knew as soon as you said that was your number six, I was like, ooh, he's going to be mad. <laughs> he's going to be mad. Uh, our number two, uh, slightly disappointingly, is Double O Love. Yeah. And of course, our number one, the title track, Instant Replay. I got to call you all out. How many of y'all actually listen to the album, or you just said, "Oh, it's called Instant Replay." That's the video. I'll put this at number one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm calling y'all out. Yes, I'm curious. Well, see, I think the big the big point was we all had Instant Replay fairly high. I think what killed Double O Love is uh, Jay actually had that as his dead last song. Yeah. So, and yeah. and I'm fairly certain Jay listened to it because he had good things to say. So, Jay, why? Uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all good yes this did end up with a 3.4 out of 10 average rating which is not too bad uh, a little bit better than the chelsea album and uh definitely further down than wicked lester which is i would say deserved but uh yeah it's kind of hard to put this next to those considering it's such a different album oops i closed that and i shouldn't have so uh, so our next episode, we're looking at an album called Nested by Laura Nairo, and that is uh, completely on YouTube. I did look that one up. I'm going to look that up again real quick just to make sure I'm giving you the correct information. But it's another, another Vinny thing. Yes, another doozy. We apologize. 
but yes, it does feature Vinny, so maybe maybe we'll hear some different uh, style of Vinny playing in this stuff. Who knows? Um, but we promise it's going to start picking up, though, after next week. Start getting into some little, I don't know, a little bit, little bit more heavy-hitting type stuff here and there. Yeah, this is uh, definitely going to be another completely different thing. I did I poked around this Laura Nairo thing just a little bit, and it seems to be a lot of uh, acoustic guitar and her singing. And she does have a decent voice. Not a specifically attractive young woman, however. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't yeah. know if I've ever seen her. I know the name. I just don't know if I've ever seen the face. I'll have to look. Yeah, cover is her face, so... <laughs> <laughs> Probably looks like me with me with a wig on. I imagine. <laughs> could be. Could be. <laughs> but, yeah. Yes. Yeah, very interesting. All right. So the Laura Nero album again. We will post this info on the Facebook page as we promised. We'll start updating that to let you guys know what's coming up and you know give you a, you know I guess if it's on YouTube we'll go ahead and post that link for you so you gotta direct way to get right to it save you the trouble uh we'll do all that for you yes also we endorse listening to music for free people <laughs> <laughs> so um we are recording this on a friday as usual so what i want everyone to do is go into the comments on facebook youtube everything and everyone wish Luke a happy birthday because tomorrow is his birthday. Just, he will just, be turning 54. Yeah. <laughs> everyone leave uh, pictures of men and Speedos and everything on the page. for yeah. him. It's for him, I promise. Yeah, sure, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I, I want to see some birthday love for Luke show up on the pages. And um, Laura Nero. See you next week. <laughs> so, is is that one gonna have the vacuum too? I, I, it's you know what, it's yet to be decided. But it may, be, it may be an industrial sized vacuum next week. Yeah. <laughs> Shop vac. <back. laughs> to bring out the thing. Oh, <laughs> uh, all right, everybody. Uh, so we're gonna get out of here for this episode again. Thanks for everyone that participated. And if you participate with the Laura Nero album again, hey, I understand it's not always easy, but we're we're getting through them. I promise. There's some really good ones coming up very very soon. So we are we are getting there. All right. So until next week, we shall see you later. <laughs>